first thanks to David Jacome who invited our speaker, uh, Wally Broker, Wallace S. Broker, um, who is a Newbury professor at Columbia University in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences uh, and at the Monte Earth Observatory. Wally's, um, he's authored over 450 journal articles and 10 books. Is that right still, 10 books? <laughs> Let's count. And, uh, and uh, most recent books from 2008 with Robert Kunzig, uh, the book Fixing Climate, Why Past Climate Change, What Past Climate Change Can Reveal About the Current Threat and How to Counter It. And 2010, The Great Ocean Conveyor, Discovering the Trigger for Abrupt Climate Change. He was the first person to coin terms such as global warming and also the ocean conveyor belt, uh, which is a critical part of the climate system, which um, carries um, over about 5,000 year time scales, carries carbon and heat into the deep ocean and it buffers the climate system. Um, his, uh, another um, primary goal of his work has been getting a better understanding of abrupt climate change and its triggers. And more recently, his interests have, have moved toward um, addressing the question of whether or not it's enough to just reduce our carbon emissions on Earth or whether or not we need to actually al also um, have engineering approaches that could suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere as an additional um, way, way to um, mitigate global warming. And also he's been working on topics like um, carbon sequestration. Thank you very much, Walter. Thank you. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. I've, I've heard of this place. I've lived in New Jersey 50 or so years, <coughs> and uh, but I've never been here. I didn't know it existed. <laughs> in a town, but never east of Washington Avenue or whatever it is. Uh, I was stunned at how beautiful your campus is. Uh, when you think so, go walk in that. No, I don't think so. Bad um, but what I want to talk about today is water. And I think that uh, the availability of water is, you know, I think you're all aware it's going to become a huge issue. Climate change or no climate change. Uh, the division of water among countries and so forth would create war. Also, we need water for agriculture. Uh, the population has reached apparently 7 billion, more or less, recently, or soon to come. It's headed for 10. Uh, some agriculturalists say that <coughs> the production of all grains on the planet are, are, are being grown at temperatures beyond their thermal optimum and that for every degree centigrade the temperature of the planet goes up productivity of these grains will go down by something like 10 percent uh, if that's correct then the population going up by 30 percent and, and, and the world warms by three degrees it, Grain production really went down by 30 percent. That would be rather, you know, if we have to work hard to produce enough food for the population. And uh, much of our grain, 40 percent of our grain, is grown by using uh, irrigated lands. And uh, as we know, uh, it takes a lot of water. <coughs> plants. Plants expend uh, several hundred molecules of water for every molecule of CO2 they take. So what I want to uh, talk about. I get you Paul. So here's the. Here's the. I'm going to press this one. Yep. 
global warming, it's clear that where it rains is going to change. Maybe the total amount of rainfall on the planet won't be much different, but where the, you know the, the pattern of rainfall is going to be quite different. And every global atmospheric ocean model predicts this. But it turned, and, and they have one thing in common. They all say that <clears throat> the tropics will get somewhat more rain and the extra tropical deserts will get somewhat less. But when you look at that in detail, um, it turns out that the predictions from the major 10 or 12 major models in the world differ widely. So this shows the changes predicted by the models. Uh, this is for the past world, the glacial world, which I'm going to talk about when they do for the future world. This diagram sort of flips and the uh, tropics go up. <coughs> but in the glacial world, they try to reconstruct what happened and you see that model to model differences are very large. And um, this is a composite of all those models uh, showing how during the peak of the last glacial period what the models would say the changes in rainfall were. Where there's white that means that the models give different senses so they don't even give anything. And of course, <clears throat> where there's color, uh, if you looked at the actual <coughs> magnitude of the change, it would differ widely. Good, next one. Now, <clears throat> I want to talk about the past. I did part of my PhD thesis studying the histories of uh, radiocarbon dating ray shorelines of <clears throat> what we call Lake Lahontan and Lake Bonneville. Lake Bonneville is the large predecessor of present-day Great Salt Lake. And <clears throat> so this is a map of what the Great Basin between high mountain ranges, no external drainage, so that any rainfall that falls into this basin has to evaporate either from soils or from standing water bodies. <coughs> this shows the contrast between about 15,000 years ago, which was a special period, millennial duration period during the deglaciation, which I'll get to later. But this is the maximum water coverage. This is 15,000 years ago. And you can see by eye that it was 10 times larger or more larger uh, coverage of water bodies than there was in 1850 before irrigation started to shrink some of the remaining lakes. Um, so the question, how, how in the hell can that happen? How can you get, you didn't get 10 times more rainfall, that's for sure. So, <clears throat> I want to show you <clears throat> something about the sensitivity of dry land to changes in rainfall. There was a uh, Russian meteorologist named Badiko who in 1958, <clears throat> based on 25 drainage basins, showed the following, that the fraction of runoff goes either to the ocean or to an interior lake, uh, the, the fraction of the rainfall that runs off is, he, he said, was a function of the amount of solar input to that area divided by the amount of energy would be required to evaporate all that rainfall. So if you have <clears throat> high solar input and low precipitation, the fraction of runoff gets very small. And if you have <clears throat> high rainfall and, and modest solar radiation, the fraction of runoff gets large. I just want to show <clears throat> one thing that 
what the area I just showed you has a runoff somewhere in the range of zero to or a few percent to 20 percent depending on the basin but let's just take an example if you had 10 percent runoff and you had solar input over precipitation ratio of two and you were to double rainfall in that area that would uh, solar input would stay about the same because you're in the same area you would go from two to one on this graph and you'd go from 10 percent runoff to 30 percent runoff so that would be six-fold change uh, that you would get um, <coughs> next this is a map showing those fractions <coughs> of runoff prepared by Randy Coster who's a former student of mine is now at NASA and you see it very hot at high latitudes you get very high runoff and that's because you get fairly low solar input but very you know considerable rainfall also in the tropics like the Amazon we have very high rainfall uh, you get high runoff, but in the desert regions of the world, the fraction of runoff is low. So this tells us a very important lesson, and that is when in, in dry land areas, and I said that 16%, I mean 40% of our grains come from irrigated land, that irrigation is either done by pumping up water from subsurface aquifers and we're mining water so we're going to run out someday or from reservoirs that are fed by runoff so if you're going to use reservoirs then you're involved in this kind of thing so if you have a decrease in rainfall it will be runoff supply to the reservoir will be greatly amplified over the change in rainfall. So that means if the dry lands of the earth become drier, the amount of water available in reservoirs is going to go down significantly. So this is a big deal. Okay, so what do we know about this whole thing? Well, as I showed you the models, tell us some things, but they disagree with one another, and um, <clears throat> so we need a second opinion. So let's take a look at how <clears throat> rainfall changed through the course of the last, let's say, 25,000 years from peak glaciation through to the present. <clears throat> and we're going to use two archives. One is the size of closed basin lakes. So they're like reservoirs, but they're not really drawn on. So the water that comes into a closed basin lake has to get out by evaporation. So if there's more rainfall, of course, the lake has to get bigger. But if there's less evaporation, it has to get bigger. So it's an index of <coughs> something about P minus E, precipitation minus evaporation. <coughs> of course deconvolving the, the, the exact the conditions is difficult but it gives us a sense of what might happen the other um, <coughs> archive I'm going to use is the oxygen isotope composition of calcite in caves and also <coughs> of atmospheric oxygen as trapped in, in ice cores, and we're going to see that's a very interesting record you get next. Okay, <clears throat> this is a record in China obtained by Larry Edwards and Hai Chang, <clears throat> University of Minnesota, showing how the oxygen isotope ratio <clears throat> in stalagmites that are <clears throat> very accurately dated most accurate dating we can do um, <clears throat> in this age range and this particular record goes back 250,000 years they've now extended it to 450 but the point is made by this the red line is a summer insulation <coughs> that changes because of the changes in the 
orbit of the Earth due to the changes in the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit, mm -hmm. uh, due to the precession of the Earth, and due to the change in tilt. Uh, <clears throat> this has a very strong 20,000 year cycle. If you count the number of cycles in there, you see that <clears throat> they average 20,000 years in length. That's a time of precession. It's very important because what the precession of the Earth does is it changes the summer radiation alternately, boosting it in the northern hemisphere, reducing it in the southern hemisphere, and vice versa. So uh, it turns out that <coughs> China's the O18 and the Cape Calcite during times of maximum solar summer insulation is higher. That, <clears throat> and I'm not going to take the time to explain, is, a, is an index of the strength of monsoon rains. So monsoon rainfall is stronger at these points and weaker at these times. Now, <clears throat> let's go to the next slide. I'm going to contrast this record I'm going to contrast this record, which is repeated down here. This is the cave record with three other records. This is a record for the oxygen isotope, comp changes in the oxygen isotope composition of oxygen in the atmosphere. And you can see it also has a strong 20,000 year cycle. And we're going to see that if we look at that in detail there's a very close tie between what happens in China and what happens globally. This is a, turns out, this is a, probably a global record of strength of monsoon rainfall in the northern hemisphere. We'll come back to that. Now, in contrast, and this is very interesting, in fact, just got onto this a couple of weeks ago, how important this is. These are records, <clears throat> the upper one is the uh, records of the size of continental ice sheets. And uh, the biggest of those <clears throat> was in, of course, in North America. The second biggest one was in Scandinavia, Europe. And <clears throat> the other one is atmospheric CO2. And you see there's very close similarity between these two records, and these two are very different. And what I'm going to say is <clears throat> that these reflect what was happening <clears throat> at high latitudes, and the high latitude climate record is very closely <coughs> connected to the conveyor circulation to changes in the way the ocean circulates. If I had a few hours, I could explain this all to you. And <clears throat> it, it turns out when you change the circulation, you change conditions at both ends of the planet. And so the, um, and this is <clears throat> changing the temperature at both ends of the planet is driving the size of the ice sheets. <clears throat> and also, because it affects the Southern Ocean, it's affecting the transfer of CO2 between the atmosphere and the ocean. So the, the record of CO2, which is a record of CO2 being drawn into the ocean and put back into the atmosphere, uh, is very closely related to polar temperatures. These records don't look anything like that. They're records of <coughs> conditions in the tropics. So why are conditions in the tropics not <coughs> tracking what goes on at the poles, or why aren't the poles, you know, tracking what goes on in the tropics? Well, it turns out that, I think anyway, that these two records are dominated not by the change in polar temperature, but they're dominated by the change in the, the the temperature difference between the hemispheres. And as I said, 
this precession cycle of 20,000 years is doing this. So it's alternately warming the summers in the northern hemisphere and then in the southern hemisphere. And we're going to see that even on a millennial time scale, the uh, changes in, in <clears throat> the average temperature of the two hemispheres is very important. Now, why is that important for the future? All models say that the northern hemisphere is going to heat twice as fast as the southern hemisphere. Uh, I don't know what you think about CO2 warming, but I'm convinced it's going to happen. And it's basic physics. And our Republican Congress has just you know, gone off the deep end in trying to deny it. magnitude of the warming is uncertain, that's for sure, but it's going to warm. And if we don't do something about it, it's going to warm the planet. The CO2 content in the air is <coughs> going to more than double. And then what we do, I would say, and if we don't do anything like we're not doing so far, it's going to triple. And we'll get maybe four or five degrees. That's big. And so we had, a, well, it's easier to think, let's say, a six degree warming. That would be eight degrees in the northern hemisphere and four degrees in the southern hemisphere. It would make a big, this is in the transient, that would make a big difference. So, <clears throat> this, what nature is telling us is that <clears throat> we're going to see both. The general warming of cooling of the planet changes the hydrologic balance, but also the changes in inner hemisphere temperature. Okay, let's go, go forward. Uh, I studied this lake, and um, in 1850, these were a little remnants of Pyramid Lake near Reno. Carson Sink, which is very shallow and has huge inland variability in its size. It's now dried up by agriculture. This lake is dried up because of uh, reservoirs and agriculture. But during peak glaciation, which lasted from about 30,000 years to, well, maybe calendar years, from about 30,000 years to 18,000 years, uh, <coughs> this lake was fluctuating around size shown by the pale blue here. 15,000 years when I said the Great Basin had the most water, this lake was this big. It was even bigger. Um, so you see an enormous difference. Um, and we're going <clears> to <throat> make a point of both of these. Go on to the next one. Um, there's another lake, Lake Bonneville. It doesn't give us the kind of information we'd really like to have because at this point it overflowed and, and ripped out its and started to flow into the sea. So the record beyond this, it could never go higher than this level. And so some of the information we get from the other lake is lost here. Next. Um, but all these are carefully dated. so. We what we're talking about. People have said for a long time that these lakes, Bonneville and Lahontan, were very large because of the proximity of the ice sheet and uh, the split of the jet stream around the major ice sheet up there. So we've made a point of looking at the records in other places in the same latitude. Perhaps the most interesting is to go from 40 north to 40 south you have a little ice down here. Uh, of course, you have sea ice in the uh, Antarctic and the Southern Ocean. Um, but you don't have a big ice sheet to deflect the, the uh, jet stream in the south. The next slide shows a record from that lake. This is a smaller lake. Um, it's shallow and it fluctuates the red color here. During the glacial period, it was this large. So again, quite a bit larger, well dated. 
um, <clears throat> at some other time that we'd love to know, but we've never found samples for dating that was this big, and this is probably in the last 50,000 years, but we can't say exactly. I would hope, I would, it would be very important to know actually, but we don't, because we don't get any data. Next. The um, Dead Sea, Sea of Galilee, was also much larger. It's a little harder to see, but during the glacial period, it was from down here, filled up the whole Jordan Valley, so that lake was maybe three times larger than it is now. And uh, so it's another one at that attitude. We would love to know what was going on in China, and we were there this summer, and starting to get the Chinese interested in studying their own work. Um, <coughs> but, so during glacial periods, the lakes at 40 degrees north and south were much bigger. So you could say that if we warm the earth, the opposite's going to happen, and that would be bad news. Of course, that's you know not a very safe assumption, but since we don't know much about it, uh, it's sort of a warning that these key areas on the planet could get drier. And if there's anything like change, in the wet direction during the glacial period when it was colder on the planet to the warm, that could make it very, very dry in these areas. Next. Now, I'm going to talk about an interesting, very interesting period of time. The last glacial period, I said, extended from something like 32,000 <coughs> to 18,000. Um, I just particip participated yesterday in a thesis defense for a man named Aaron Putnam. Uh, he had been using beryllium-10 to date mountain glacier moraines. And he's done this in, uh, it's been done now in the Ant Southern Andes in the New Zealand Alps and in the western U.S. And the interesting thing is this conforms with the idea that the cooling at those latitudes was symmetrical, so that the lowering of the snow lines in New Zealand was the same as it was in the Wind River Mountains in, in the western <coughs> U.S. So that it seems like those mountain glaciers were following following the pattern that we saw for ice volume and CO2. To me, that says CO2 played a big role in cooling the planet during the glacial period. It uh, doesn't prove it, but it's interesting. Now that glacial period came to an end, and then things got to be very different. And <clears throat> these are records of uh, CO2, in red here, uh, O18 temperature, uh, or actually deuterium hydrogen temperature in the snow in Antarctica. These are bubbles in the Antarctic ice. But the Antarctic record also contains <clears throat> a very good record of what was going on in the north. This is a methane record. These methane changes were mainly due to changes in the swampiness in the north. And if, <coughs> if we went to Greenland, ice core record, the temperature <coughs> and in Greenland would have looked exactly like, like this. I mean, a little bit different, but it has the same shape. So you see an interesting thing. CO2 is rising during this period. It's warming in the south, southern hemisphere. The northern hemisphere is staying cold. Then at this point, the northern hemisphere suddenly gets warm. My conveyor belt turned on at that time, warmed the north, but at the same time, it did something in the south that stopped the warming and actually created a cooling. 
it's a scene in the mountain glaciers in the southern hemisphere as well. And then this warm period came to a sudden end and they had a very cold period and at that same time Antarctica started to warm. That's why it's important to have this all in one ice core so there's no doubt about the phasing. You've got it all in one record. So methane is mixed throughout the atmosphere so you get the same methane record in Greenland that you do in Antarctica. So now we're going to look at what happened during this time. It turned out that when the Great Basin was wettest, it was during this interval right here. And I'm going to make a big point of this change. This is probably the largest and most sudden change in climate in the last 100,000 or last 50,000 years was the, this transition right here when the conveyor turned on and the warming in Antarctica slowed down. So let's look at the record. Okay, so what that did is <clears throat> let's go back. During this time and this time, when the conveyor was stopped, that allowed sea ice to form in the northern Atlantic, winter sea ice. It extended all the way out of the Arctic and down to the <coughs> uh, latitude of uh, Great Britain, exactly where we don't know, but a huge ice cover. Greenland, during this interval here, <coughs> Greenland summers cooled by about 5 degrees, winter cooled by 25 degrees. This is well documented, and I have not had time to go and cool it to you. I had to take my word for it. And that cooling was caused because when you turn this conveyor circulation off, it allows sea ice to form. And the sea ice makes the northern Atlantic like Siberia. No ocean heat can come out. That's very important now. And of course, the ice is reflective, so it reflects away sunshine and uh, so it made it very very cold. Uh, so that cooled the northern hemisphere at the same time we know that at these two times the southern ocean uh, upwelling increased producing a lot of opal and also releasing CO2 to the atmosphere that had been stored in the ocean during glacial times. And so these were times when sea ice retreated around Antarctica. Uh, I didn't mention it, but I showed that one global picture. Sea ice in the southern ocean during peak glacial period extended eight degrees in the winter further out than it does now. So that was a huge apron. That apron retreated during these two times. So what that did is made the, the northern hemisphere, because of more sea ice got colder, the southern hemisphere, because of less sea ice got warmer, and that moved the thermal equator. And that made a big difference in rainfall. Uh, <coughs> the rivers out here flowing out here are now, this is a dry area, Brazil, they don't carry much sediment out. Uh, during this interval, when the thermal equator was moved south, the rain belts were moved south, and huge amounts of sediment came out into the Atlantic, and they're very well recorded in deep sea sediments. It stands out like a store's thumb. Cave right here, the people of Minnesota went there, and the cave which is now dry, was dry most of the time during the glacial period, but during the times when the thermal equator moved south, you've got deposition on the stalagmites, beautifully dated. And uh, uh, then what I'll show you is the Altiplano here. Uh, next slide. 
this is the high area in the Andes, and everybody knows about Lake Titicaca. James Bond movie where the guy died staggering across the desert. He was down here. It's a very dry area. There's a little lake right here. But <clears throat> during um, glacial period, this little lake here became this big lake here. And during the first of these intervals of, of heavy sea ice cover in the North Atlantic and retreating sea ice in the South Atlantic, this lake got to be the size of the blue here. So much more rainfall on the Altiplano. Okay, next one. Now, <coughs> I showed you the record in, in China was one of the first slides. And I gave it a very long time scale and you could see the 20,000 year periodicity. Now I'm looking at a short time scale from the end of the last glacial period up until uh, the beginning of the present interglacial. So for a period of 8,000 years. And here's the detail of the strength of the monsoons. So during this time when it was warm in the northern hemisphere, the monsoons were strong when there was heavy sea ice in the north, the monsoons were much weaker in both of these times. And this is interesting, this change occurred in something like 20 years. These were sudden abrupt climate changes. And they report times when you stopped that conveyor circulation, the next winter sea ice would form. So these changes are very fast, and that's proven in the ice cores. Okay, next. So if we look at the records we have, and of course we're trying to get more, um, I showed you that this was a major transition, the beginning of what we call a bowling alley period. Uh, was at 14,700 plus or minus 100 years, somewhere in there. That's the accuracy of the data. And um, you see that different places did different things. Lake Victoria, before this time, was dry. Lake Victoria, the hell of a big lake, right on the equator. Uh, a guy named Tom Johnson in Minnesota took four piston cores in that lake, and he found that each one bottomed out in a layer that had grass on it. And then he did uh, seismic reflections around the lake, and that soil horizon makes a very strong reflector, and he showed that it was all over the lake. The lake was dry. The sediment immediately above that, when the lake reformed, Dates right here. So this lake went from dry to being sizable at this time. Uh, the caves in China, and there are three different ones that show the same record, all show weak monsoons to strong monsoon transition uh, uh, at, at this time. Uh, the lakes in the, in the uh, Great Basin which were large, of course this one's overflowing, but it's still large, they all dropped and became much smaller. Uh, Estancia, which is a smaller lake near Albuquerque, dried up entirely. Um, the Dead Sea probably dried up. Uh, my wife Elizabeth and I were over there in November and the Israelis were drilling a deep core and drilled um, several hundred meters into the sediments of the Dead Sea, right on the international boundary between Jordan and Israel. And they got a beautiful record that showed that uh, this time you had a huge salt deposit formed, so the Dead Sea basically dried up. Um, 
and we showed in, in eastern Brazil that the, the cane went from forming stalagmite to dry. And um, we also find all lakes. So this was a result of the shifts in the thermal equator. So when the sea ice was big in the north and small in the south, you had a shift in the thermal equator to the south. And then when the conveyor started, it melded the ice in the north and allowed it to reform in the south. You got the opposite of thermal equator moving the other way. That's what happened right here. So I'm going to show you one last piece of evidence and then I'll get to conclusions. This is perhaps the most interesting. Uh, Jeff Severinghouse, who was once a graduate student with me, is now a hotshot professor at University of San Diego at Scripps. He decided to do extremely accurate and detailed measurements of the isotopic composition of oxygen gas trapped in bubbles in uh, ice cores, in this particular one I think it's from Greenland. It wouldn't matter to get the same record if he took one from Antarctica because his signals mix throughout the atmosphere. And now oxygen in our atmosphere is replaced on a time scale of about a thousand years. In other words, it takes plants in the ocean and atmosphere about a thousand years to produce the amount of oxygen in the air. So the average lifetime of an atmospheric oxygen molecule is about a thousand years. So this record is integrated over a thousand years. So what Severinghouse did is differentiated it in a sense to find out the instantaneous changes in oxygen that would be required to generate this integrated record. And this is what he got, if we call it a deconvolution. And this is uh, Larry Edwards' cave record. Uh, you can see that amazing similarity. If you look at this, there's a slight difference. That's a dating error in the ice. Severing House has now moved this over to here. I mean, uh, if these actually were at different times. These are at the same time. So every detail in here is recorded in, um, in average isotopic composition of atmospheric oxygen. Severing House thinks that this is a record of the strength of monsoon rainfall, which is going to affect the amount of photosynthesis Well, the light oxygen that we're seeing here is going to be uh, added to the, that same effect is going to be shown in the atmosphere. So this is a really, he thinks, a record of northern hemisphere monsoon rainfall. Whatever it is, it's clear that this is not just China. This is a much broader thing that's happening. And, um, so this shows, uh, shows, well, this is the same record I showed before. Okay, so what have we learned? We've learned that when you warm and cool the whole planet, but when you cool the whole planet uh, with CO2, we tend to make the area, the desert dry lands in a latitude 40 degrees north and south, they have, it's wetter there, a lot more available water. So the implication would be as you warm the whole planet, it will go the other way. Then the other thing we've learned is that when you do this with the, the uh, summer warming, either by Processional cycle, or by these sea ice changes, uh, you alternately you change the uh, hydrological situation by moving the um, thermal 
played it back and forth. So we're now poised to push the thermal equator to the north by heating the northern hemisphere faster. Now, there are complications. There's a, there are some differences, of course. All the aerosols we're adding are mainly in the north. And that's kind of the cool time. But we don't really know how big that is. Also, on the time scales here, the ocean and land, the ocean had a chance to catch up. So uh, the, the temperature changed with both ocean and land. Whereas what we're going to do is we're going to warm the land the ocean's going to lag behind. And that's why the northern hemisphere is going to heat faster, because it's got so much more land, and land has less heat capacity. Uh, so what I'm looking at in the past is not a perfect analog. And of course, so making predictions based on that you know, are iffy. But since the models are also iffy, uh, have to sort of take what we have. And what we have said, we better worry about this. And we may luck out, and these things won't happen. But we may be in for major shifts in the availability of water. And as I said at the beginning, this is going to affect dry lands. What, two billion people live in dry lands? A lot of the water comes from reservoirs and also from aquifers. Uh, they're both in danger. And so those people who are generally poor, if, if their lands were to dry out, this would make life even more difficult for them. So it's something we have to think about and uh, say how we would counter it. You could say, well, let's desalinate seawater. Of course, that's happening in Jerusalem, for instance, getting almost all of this domestic water from the Mediterranean to desalinate it. But uh, I think the average, if I get this right, well, let's put it this way, the average water consumption required to grow your food something like 20 times greater than the amount associated with your life in a city. And so it would be easy to pay for, uh, you know, desalinated water for drinking. But for agriculture, it would get up at current prices something like $200,000 uh, $2, $2, in desalination to grow the food for one person. So that would be prohibitively expensive for most people on the planet. Um, anyway, that's not good news, but um, what we're doing now is we're burying our heads in the sand and hoping it'll all go away. We're denying the reality of it that our Congress is doing. And that's just absolutely unforgivable because it's based on physics and, and physics, you know, you may not know the magnitude, but physics says that if we put greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, it's going to warm. And as it warms, it raises the water vapor pressure over the ocean, which raises the water vapor content of the atmosphere, which acts as a sizable ap amplifier, like a factor of three. So doubling of CO2 is one degree warming. Nothing else happens. But with water vapor feedback, it becomes more like three degrees, three and a half degrees warming. So that's the best estimate we can make. But you know, we may luck out one and a half degrees. We may that it's not three degrees, it's four and a half degrees. Uh, and that's certainly an uncertainty that exists, but it's probably symmetrical.
next, it's going to get bigger and it's going to get smaller. So, uh, if you'd like to ask questions, I enjoy answering them. I shouldn't be doing this. I'm 80 years old. <laughs> I should, you know, go live on a farm. <laughs> Yeah, but why do you think uh, Congress is ignoring this problem? Well, economics is the obvious thing. And what? Half the people in our country don't even believe in evolution. Yeah. So, I mean, people just don't take science seriously, I guess. They uh, listen to television. I, I don't know. Uh, it's really a tragedy. What I hope is that, that during this interim where we probably aren't going to do anything anywhere in the world, I mean, the combination of the global depression and this growing attitude that it's not important is just going to stall everything. But if we're smart, we'll do the background work that has to be done. I personally think that one of the absolutely essential elements in solving the problem, the solution, that one of the big parts of it will be taking CO2 directly out of the air. You should get Klaus Lochner from across the Columbia to talk about this. Uh, it's very doable. He knows how to do it. But nobody wants to put up the money to uh, build a prototype. We spent so far about seven million dollars. Maybe a couple other people around the globe who spent a few more million. But that's what a Yankee pitcher makes in the summer. It's <laughs> but I mean, so for very small amounts of money, we could be learning how to capture and bury CO2. We could be doing things like that. I mean, people are working on alternate energy, and that's, of course, equally important. But I think in the interim between now and the time that our main energy supply comes from some other thing besides fossil fuels, CO2 is going to go way up. And, and, uh, Either we're going to have to, uh, fossil fuels are going to be burned, either we're going to have to grab that CO2 and put it away, or an even worse thing is going to happen. If it gets really warm, it turns out it's 10 times cheaper to put SO2 in the stratosphere and put band-aids on the problem by reflecting away some of it than it would be to tackle a problem directly and get to stop CO2 emissions. So uh, you've got a number of people here have that to look forward to. Uh, I'll bet you that'll become a major issue. That's a very doable thing. And, uh, but you can imagine that it's not solving a problem. It's, it's uh, putting a band-aid on it. But we may have to put the band-aid on it just to get through the high point of CO2 and before we can start to drop that down again. By the way, it's not it'll go in the ocean but very slowly. And so to get it back down, we're going to have to use something like Klaus Lochner has invented, and that is we're going to have to pull it back out of the atmosphere. So either we do it during the transition or we get desperate. I mean, or we'll do it later because we'll want to stop adding SO2 to the stratosphere and tackle a problem directly. And that will involve pulling the CO2 out of the air because otherwise it's going to stay there and keep the planet warm. And the ice caps are not going to melt catastrophically. But if we leave the CO2 there for several hundred years, they're certainly going to melt significantly and eat up a lot of valuable land. Something. Uh, other questions? 
Thank you for the lecture. It was fascinating. I'm afraid a lot of us have to run to the career fair. The whole row is going to take off. Here. Okay. Okay. We should go. Thank you. If people want to stick around for another question, do the we'll pick it back up in about 30 seconds when all the points are done. Somebody else? Any more questions? Well, I was going to ask about the economics, uh, the, your band aid that you talked about. What are the side effects of that, that band aid? Because that may have its own. That may have well, you know, we know quite a bit about it. The Kenneth Google put up the amount mm -hmm. that would be required that we have to put up every year, because these aerosols would only stay up there one or two years. Mm -hmm. that, we put them up there. that has, you know, one safety feature in it. If it's really bad, you just stop. You just you know, wait for it. But uh, other things, you know, um, it's going to affect the ozone.